Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is James Lasher, staff writer here at Charisma News with Charisma Media, and I am joined by Rabbi Kurt Schneider, who, Rabbi, we just thank you so much uh, for your time today, for going into a little bit further of a discussion from your video that you just posted at, late in February, talking about the warning to America and what's moving into the end times that American culture is hoping for versus what the scripture actually says. Amen. So, Rabbi, I want to thank you so much today for your time and joining us here at Charisma News. God bless you, James. Thank you so much for partnering with me and uh, what we're doing together as a team. I love working with Charisma. As you know, I've had several books published through Charisma and the people that I've worked with there. I've enjoyed all of them. So great to be with you today. Great. Well, it's wonderful to have you, Rabbi. Thank you. And and I'm definitely looking forward to picking your brain a little bit more about, you know, the end times just seems to be a hot button topic today because of all that we see, not just nationwide, but worldwide. In cultures across the globe, we see shifts occurring. And you address some of these with the end times being on so many people's minds, almost a fear of what is going on, but also that hope of returning to a simpler time, hoping to go back. Yeah. But you discussed that the scriptures, in fact, don't don't confirm that. They don't line up with going back to how things were. In fact, for us to get to the tribulation eventually, things are in fact going to get worse. Could you then elaborate a little bit on what are some of the things that are happening and will still have to occur with what scripture says and how that aligns to culture and society moving forward. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, brother. Well, yes, I know that my view is a bit controversial with some that are prophesying a great revival, the greatest revival the world has ever seen. And there may be a great revival, but concerning the earth and America and Western culture, I do not believe that we will turn back to a Judeo-Christian culture. I don't think America will ever be a Judeo-Christian country again in the way that we think of in the past. There's been too many breaches that have been broken, uh, the breakdown of morality of the family, the sophistication of nuclear weapons and rogue countries that have gotten their hands on nuclear weapons. We will not be able to repair what's been broken. And I believe this is not just an observation that I'm making intellectually. I believe this is what scripture is, it, 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 you know, told us 2000 years ago. Again, my point is, is that many people are talking about a great turnaround for America. I don't think there's any president that's going to turn the country around. I mean, I think we can make changes. I think we can mm -hmm. hold some things back. But the things that have happened, in my opinion, cannot go uh, back to what they were. It's not going to be like a pendulum where, you know, it swings to this side and then it corrects itself and swings back to this side. For in other words, I don't think the, um, the uh, divorce rate in this country will ever go to what it was in the 1930s. I don't believe that people's identity sexually in terms of male, female, with traditional understanding of what that means, will ever go back to what it was in the 1930s. I think the gender fluidity movement will continue to expand. I just see greater chaos and confusion ahead. And I think that chaos is one of the primary essential manifestations of evil. So I am a voice crying in the wilderness saying, stop looking for some great turnaround that America is going to somehow become this great Christian nation again, because I believe the scripture says that we're going to go from bad to worse and that Jesus will not return until this happens. Amen. Uh, Rabbi, you, you mentioned some amazing points how almost like the cat is out of the bag on some of these things in yeah. society. You know, 20 years ago, as you mentioned, the gender fluidity ideology that is being preached, it wasn't a topic of conversation, but now it dominates headlines every single day. And there's no way for people to just forget about that or turn around because we are engaged in spiritual warfare. The enemy's not just going to take it on the chin and lay down for us. He's going to keep fighting till the end, even though he knows he's already lost in the end. Um, you make good mention that society, while there are pockets of revival, has been on a downturn culturally really for decades now. And 
it really brings to mind in Revelation, the letters to the churches. And I think these times where it talks about some churches had completely lost their way. Some were still kind of stumbling even though they were upholding certain tenets of Christianity and faith, while others had stayed strong. But unfortunately, those that did not have corrections issued to them were in the minority. Does that kind of line up how perhaps you see, according to Scripture, how culture is lining up? Some churches are stumbling, looking to re-engage that love for Christ, while others have just fallen to the wayside and given themselves to the ways of the world. You know, it's an interesting point that you're raising, James, because you think about Christian culture. You think about, for example, the culture of America, Judeo-Christian country uh, where certain morality was agreed upon by everyone. Uh, There was a time, as you know, that most people living in America would self-identify as Christians because it was part of the moral fiber of the country. But Being part of a moral fiber because of the culture is different than being a true born-again disciple and follower of Jesus. I think the true born-again disciples and followers of Jesus have always been a remnant of people, whether we were living in a time where it seemed that the nation was entirely Christian. I mean, that's an exaggeration, not entirely Christian. (laughs) all outlaws and things happening, et cetera. But when, by and large, We were considered a moral Christian nation. I think even during then, it was only a remnant that were truly born again followers and disciples of Jesus. So that relates, I think, to your point about the churches, that during this age, I think there are some churches that are, I'm just going to call them remnant churches. They're going to be committed to preaching the word. They're going to be committed to dying to self so Jesus can increase. They're going to be willing to pay the cost to be rejected for their bold stand that Jesus is the only way. They're going to be willing to stand up and reject the LGBT agenda. And and, and Mm -hmm. there will be those remnant communities of people until the end. But by and large, we're going to see uh, people compromising more and more because Jesus said straight and narrow is the way that leads to life and beauty. Mm -hmm find it. And he also said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? Yes, Rabbi, I couldn't agree with you more. And those powerful questions, you know, for the Christian church to consider from the Word of God. And I I love your use of the word remnant. And what comes to mind for me is Nehemiah during the times of Israel back then, the remnant who began looking back towards their Lord, their God, who brought them out of Egypt, who established them as a nation and led them to the promised land. And it seems like there's parallels between what ancient Israel went through leading up to the eventual occupation and destruction as they knew it of their nation before the Lord restored that and what America is going through today, the cultural breakdown, as you mentioned, the morality shift within the people. And when you look at these, it's a perfect example for many American Christians, not just of Jewish descent, but all who believe because Jesus Christ bridged that gap for us to salvation, you know, to, excuse me, to learn from the lessons of the Israelites and their plight, you know, how important then is the issue of biblical literacy amongst Christians today to fully comprehend the times that we are living in? Well, absolutely. Let me just first of all put an exclamation mark on a point that you uh, raised, James, and that is the rem within Israel. You know, the mm-hmm. Lord said to, uh, to, to Abraham, he said, though your descendants be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant shall be saved. And uh, the same has always been true with Israel. Think about Gideon. You know, it was a small remnant. Yeshua, it's interesting that the deeper Yeshua went in his ministry and the revelation of God and what God was calling mankind to, the deeper he went, the less people stayed with them. You think about John Mm -hmm. 6. You know, there were so many people in John 6 that started. Then he started talking. I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. He's starting to go really deep. Yes. I thought, what's this message? And they're quite, what do you mean you're the bread of life? We know your mom and dad. We know your dad's <laughs> carpenter. And Jesus, right. can, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, become, they're grumbling now. And Jesus, they, Jesus said, don't grumble among yourself. Mm-hmm. No one can yes. come to me unless the Father draws them. All the Father gives me shall come to me. And he that comes to me, I'll no eyes cast out. 
He goes on a little deeper now. The grumbling has started. The division is taking place. Jesus isn't offset by that because he knows that only a remnant will believe those whom the Father has chosen. So he continues mm-hmm. on. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, John 6, you have no life in yourself. And they said, who can listen to this? And they all left. The only <laughs> people that stayed with him were the 12 apostles. And Jesus said right. to him, Do you, are you guys going to live too? And they said, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. And then Yeshua said, this is why I said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted from the Father. In John 10, Jesus was looking at the masses. He says, you believe not, he said, because you're not my sheep. I know my sheep. My Father gave them to me, and no one is able to pluck them out of the Father's hand. So Jesus came knowing that only a remnant— would really come to him and stay with him and cling to him. And that's the message of hope that we have as God's people. And we need Mm -hmm. to be equipped to your point, James, in the word of God. Because without being equipped by the word of God, how will we be able to discern what's going on right now? We're just going to be swept Mm -hmm. away by our emotions. That's the problem that's happening right now, James, in a nutshell. Humanity, especially the younger culture, they're being swayed by their emotions rather Mm -hmm. than rooted in the word of God. You take the LGBT movement. And let me say, first of all, this is not an, uh, uh, this is not judgment, condemnation against any person. I think people that, uh, I, I do believe people are born with same sex attraction. I do believe that there are people from their earliest memory have their first attraction being of the same sex. That's because sin is in the world. Sin is broken down humanity. We've been stained by it. We've been broken by it in different ways. Some people are prone to stealing. Some people are prone to lying. Mm -hmm. Some people are prone to alcoholism. Some people are, you know, all are broken in some way. So I do believe that people that are in the LGBT community, some of them, it's not like they suddenly decided I'm going to be in rebellion against God and start eating a homosexual lifestyle. They're they're, they're trapped in in that same-sex attraction. But that's why Jesus came, to save us all. He came to deliver us from evil. So there's a difference between um, um, loving somebody versus Mm -hmm. owning a lifestyle or behavior. And that's the problem as it relates to the Word of God. Too many people today that identify with Christians are so moved by their emotions and their compassion Mm -hmm. by people that they know and love that are in uh, same-sex relationships and uh, those people that are in same-sex attraction relationships are saying, you know, this is my earliest memory. Uh, this is who I am. And Christians listen to this and their heart is so moved because they've hurt so badly for somebody that is in this situation. And then their heart goes out so much to those that are trapped in this situation that rather than sticking to God's word, which condemns homosexuality as sin, and which is mm-hmm. obvious to even common sense that two men can't have babies and two women can't have babies, that mm-hmm. God's first command to humanity was multiply and fill the earth, that it's only mm-hmm. common sense tells us that God did not create men to be with men and women to be with m- women. So we have God's word that, that, that condemned it from the beginning the common sense revelation that it makes no sense. And yet we're so moved by our emotions and compassion for humanity that we abandon God's word, even abandon Mm -hmm. common sense. And now we have Christians, even a majority potentially of younger Christians that are siding with the LGBT movement. In fact, I just uh, released a video uh, yesterday called Taking the Rainbow Back. Yes. The movement has begun, and we created a website called takingtherainbowback.org. And what I'm calling on believers to do is in the month of July to wear a shirt with a rainbow on it. We're actually producing the shirts with the scripture on it from Revelation 4 3. There's a rainbow around (laughs) the throne, but we've let the LGBT community steal something that's beautiful and is actually a sign of an everlasting covenant from God. So the problem that gets to your point, James, Christians are not rooted and and, and they're not walking in fidelity to God's word, mm-hmm. swayed by the culture. And unfortunately, they're letting their emotions, and their compassion overrule what God's word says. Amen. Powerful words, Rabbi. Thank you for that in depth. And, you know, it's it's when you bring up the remnant, 
and how often the remnant has come under attack, just like uh, the, the radiant symbol of God's promise, the rainbow, the enemy is going to do everything he can to steal, to steal these people who are currently you know, afflicted with these lies about their identity, their lies about their sexuality, that the enemy is trying to warp the image that God created them in, the purpose that God has created for them, specifically in the, their identity in Christ Jesus, in, in the Lord, that he molded them. You know, it, it goes back in history how often the enemy has been attacking that remnant and to kind of maybe diverge slightly, but continue on about that remnant and how the enemy is attacking it in the world today. We see anti-Semitism specifically increasing, and it's it's not localized just any one country. It's all over the world. Wherever there are Jews, the enemy is still attacking God's people. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, for Christians today, whether it's in America, the United Kingdom, in Poland, in Ukraine, in Africa, where these Christians are, can you explain to us why it is so important today for Christians to understand their Jewish roots as well as followers of Christ? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, to your first point, uh, James, about mm -hmm. the rising anti-Semitism that we're seeing around the world, I believe you're absolutely correct that it is totally a scheme of the devil uh, lies that the devil has mm -hmm. told the world through media by constantly feeding humanity with pictures of Jewish people uh, defending their borders and defending their country. But what the media is showing, obviously, is Palestinians and their suffering. And that is a terrible thing. But once again, what's happened? Humanity has let their emotions overrule what the Word of God teaches about the Jewish people, where the Lord says, mm -hmm. I will bless those that bless you, I will curse you that curse you. And God's truth about the nation of Israel is an everlasting, um, there's an everlasting promise to Jewish people about the, about the land of Israel. It's really the same thing, though. Christians and the world side with their emotions, their human mm -hmm. emotions, rather than standing with the Word of God. Now, to your second point, my brother and my friend, uh, James, how important is it for Christian people, Jew and Gentile alike, specifically I'm speaking to Gentile Christians right now, to understand the Jewish roots of their faith? You know what's a, 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 a great thought just to begin this conversation? You think about the first verse in the New Testament, James, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. What's the yes, first sir. verse in the New Testament? We believe God designed it. The first verse is this, Matthew 1, 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, yeah. the son of David, the son of Abraham. So the yes. very first verse of the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament brings us back to the Torah, to the first book of our Bible, the book of Genesis. So God thinks it's pretty important that we yes. understand the link between Jesus going all the way back to the book of Genesis, that it's that <laughs> Jesus didn't appear in a vacuum. Okay, right. he's, he's Jewish. He died with the sign of his head. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he said to the woman at the well in John 4, woman, she was a Samaritan. She wasn't Jewish. She mm -hmm. wasn't practicing Judaism, had a different philosophy. And Jesus said, woman, you don't know what you're worshiping. Salvation right. is from the Jews. And it's, it's so, I don't want to use the word ironic, but almost intentional by the Lord that the man he chose to send the word to the Gentiles, a Jew among Jews, a Pharisee, in his prior life before this radical conversion from Saul to Paul is the one who sent the word of God, the word of Jesus to, you know, that the Messiah, he, he has arrived. He's here and he's ascended and he's coming back. That's who the Lord used. And so it, it almost just lines up too perfectly for those who are paying attention why the enemy wants to silence and to continually attack the Lord's people. And so for, for many Christians, uh, myself, you know, I've had the ancestry DNA test and it turned out no, no Jewish, uh, background, you know, nothing like that. And my mother was a little disappointed because she's been to Israel, loves, loves the country, loves the Hebrew people. But for Christians who have no real background in the Jewish Christian relationship and the background from the Old Testament and how it merges with the New Testament. It's not cut off from, but they they are 
together in their message of redemption, this redemption story from creation. You know, how how can one go about to start studying this heritage that is that has been bridged then for Christians? The the Abrahamic covenant is obviously still in place. The Lord's promise never fails. But how can one just get started to even understand, you know, from the Jewish holidays to to certain practices and the importance thereof within those? Right. That's a really good question, because the truth is, is that, you know, people are hearing this message and they're going to want to take a hold of it. They're going to say, I need to learn the Hebrew Bible. I need to understand the Jewish roots of their, my faith. They're going to start reading in the book of Genesis, as most have already done. They'll be encouraged. But by the time they get to Leviticus and Numbers and then into, into some of the history and the prophets, they're wondering, what the heck does this have to do with me? And they just give up. And I understand that because right. it is very difficult when you're looking, in, when, when you're in the middle of the forest and you're just looking at the trees, it's hard to see the big picture. I understand yes. why many Christian people have not been able to um, sustain a passion to understand how what we in Judaism call the Tanakh and what the church calls mm-hmm. the Old Testament, how that relates to them. My answer to the question that you just asked is find a good teacher, find a good Jewish uh, believer in Jesus. And there are some Gentile teachers, too, that teach on the Jewish roots of the Christian faith that do an excellent job. Find a good teacher that can simplify it. That's what's really needed. It, 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 we need, you know, the Bible is given to the church apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers yes. for the equipping of the saints. So I think it's really important on this particular subject of understanding the Jewish roots of our faith, how the Old and New Testaments, James, connect together like a hand in a glove. It's important to find a good teacher that can simplify, that can take out the details from the detail. Mm-hmm. So and understand the concepts. I mean, we've got a ton of resources online and books. I know with Charisma, I wrote a book called um, Lion of Judah, which deals with a lot of these things, a lot of teaching resources. There are other great teachers out there as well, but find a good teacher and make sure that you find a teacher that's balanced because often Mm -hmm. what happens is Christians begin to discover the Jewish roots of their faith and they begin to become so romanced by Judaism, Mm -hmm. they lose focus on Jesus. And that's a real Mm -hmm. danger as well. So find a teacher that can help you to understand the Hebrew roots of your faith, but keep the focus on Jesus and being led by the Spirit. Well, thank you so much for that insight. And it sounds like even as as you said in your previous uh, video at the end of February, you know, Christians and Jews alike during these times, we need to be rock solid in the faith and understanding then the history behind it to to know where you're going, know the history behind it almost and and how the enemy is using these times. And and when you have that understanding, like you said, to just have it simplified to you, you know, I, I have as you mentioned, you know, once you get to Levitical law, perhaps it gets a little difficult to understand. And you need somebody who is fluent and understanding of that to break it down for you. I myself, I did eventually make it through the numbers, but it it wouldn't be in the Bible if it wasn't important to the Lord, right. which then taking that knowledge of and understanding that if the Lord thinks this is important, I need to take the time. And and as you've mentioned, you know, uh, emotionalism is playing such a huge role in faith these days that you need to acknowledge these emotions, but then control them and exactly. discipline yourself. Uh, you make wonderful mention of the importance of discipleship. Jesus had the disciples who then discipled theirs. And to continue that practice onto today is so key and important. So Rabbi, I just want to thank you so much for your insight into the times that we're living in and how they line up with scripture and moving forward, what Christians can expect to uh, endure along with their Jewish brethren and sisters in the world today. So thank you so much for your time, your teaching. And if you would not mind, could you please just end this interview today with a prayer? God bless you, my brother. Thank you, my friend, for our time together today. Father, we worship you. We bless you today. And Father, we need you today. Mm -hmm. And Father, we cling to you today because we realize, Lord, that apart from your grace, we would get washed away just as the rest. It's all about you. So, Father, we come humbly to you today. We ask you to strengthen us, Daddy, by the same power that you used when you raised Jesus, Yeshua, from the dead. And Father, we ask that your word 
would be fire within us, that you would refine us and ground us by your word. And we worship you today, King Jesus, Yeshua, and we give you all the glory. Thank you for your promise that you said that you would complete in us what you began. And Father, we want to complete the purpose that we're on earth to do for you. We want to bear fruit a hundredfold. So we lift our lives to you right now. And we ask, Father God, that you would have your way in us and that we would finish our course in this world through the mighty working of your spirit, through your son in us, by bearing fruit for you a hundredfold. Father, we speak to any today that have been lethargic or scared. Father, we just speak life to them today and pray, Father God, that you would raise them up to boldly follow you to their last breath in this world. In Yeshua's name, for your glory, a hundredfold fruit we ask today for, Father. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for that powerful pair, Rabbi. Thank you for joining us today. Again, I'm James Lasher, staff writer for Charisma News at Charisma Media. Have a wonderful day.